Well, hello everyone. Good day. On behalf of the global team of at New Pedagogies for Deep Learning, I want to welcome you all today. This is our first webinar in a series that we're hosting during these very uncertain and challenging times. My name is Mag Gardner and I'm based here in Ontario, Canada. For those of you who are unaware of our work, New Pedagogies for Deep Learning is a global organization whose purpose is to foster deep learning so that all learners contribute to the common good, address global challenges, and flourish in a complex world. Essentially, we want to enable all students to be good at learning and good at life. In future webinars, we will be exploring deep learning in more depth. At the end of this session, we will also share our website address so you can get more information. Thank you in advance for having your microphone on mute and for shutting off your video. As you can see, there are hundreds joining us today and we expect more than a thousand. So we invite you to introduce yourself as you've been doing and indicate where you're from in the chat box. As Jean shares, you may wish to ask questions in the Q&A box. We will have two points in the session where Jean will address some of your questions. Let's now share a little bit about Jean Clinton. Jean is a clinical psychiatrist and knowledge translator. She is passionate about youth, well-being, and system improvement. She's also a special advisor to New Pedagogies for Deep Learning. So pleased to invite Jean to share her wisdom and insights with us now. Take it away, Jean. Great. Hi. Uh, well, hello, everybody. I am uh, just very thrilled to be here uh, with you. I'll be even more thrilled if I can make my slides move. Um, I have uh, the distinct pleasure of spending this time uh, with you from, uh, from all across the world. And there's a couple of things that you need to know about me. You've heard from, uh, uh, from Mag a little bit, but uh, I'm a, a, a child psychiatrist by, uh, by training. But what you also need to know about me is, uh, as you say, well, what are we listening to a child psychiatrist about in terms of education? Uh, well, I'm an upstreamist, uh, periodically an extremist, but mainly an upstreamist. And that's because I've spent many, many years in uh, clinical work and realizing that I'm in the middle of a, a, a rushing, rushing river, trying madly to capture one or two kids and families at a time. And I really had to realize that I needed to think about why are kids falling in the river in the first place? And so to go upstream and see, can I make a difference in the conditions that lead to children running into difficulties? So I'm an upstreamist. I'm also a knowledge translator. I'm, I love the brain. I'm a brain geek. That's the second thing you need to know about me. It has completely changed the way I think about clinical work as well as the work of education. So I'm going to do a little um, uh, neuroscience uh, trick with you here. And what we know is that when our attention is focused, and I hope that that's what's happened here, if when our attention is focused and our memory is turned on, then we learn. That's, what, that's the magic formula. Memory plus attention equals learning. And so I'm giving you a task to do right at the very, very start. And that is through this webinar here to think about three things that are completely new to you that were unknown to you before. So three, unknown. Two, think of things that are so interesting you'll continue to research them or share with someone else. And at the end, I'll ask you very clearly to think about one thing that you're going to change about your practice based on the information shared today. And this is the work of uh, Dr. Tracy Tokohama Espinosa, who uh, uh, has become a great friend to new pedagogies. So what I'm going to spend the next time speaking with you about is really what is well-being and how is it related to learning? I'll also talk about how does stress and emotion, how are they related to well-being and learning? And how can we manage our own stress in these times and manage and support the stress of others as well? So when, when I ask the question, what is well-being? There are, there are as many definitions about well-being as there, as there are, um, well, maybe not stars in the Milky Way, but you get my point. There's a whole lot of definitions of, of well-being. 
And so what I want to, I want to lay, the, lay the ground for you to think about your own self and when you have performed at your peak, when things have been just in flow, as it were. So that sense of well-being is when we learn best. And so what I'm going to be a little bit provocative and say to you, is it possible that we start to think about the view of education as one where our kids achieving, developing a sense of their identity, a sense of their purpose, is in fact also a goal of education. And for you to think about yourselves as human developers. Uh, the team has been looking very carefully at the co-construction of achievement, academic achievement and well-being as being like the double helix of the DNA of learning and through that kids actually thrive. But let's talk for a minute about what is mental well-being and the definitions that really resonate for me are the following two. One is from the World Health Organization and key to this is that well-being is way more than the absence of illness. It's actually about flourishing. So think about this definition and think about your role as educators. Do you see yourself contributing to your own well-being through these channels and to the well-being and education of kids? So what is mental well-being? A state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own potential. I want to suggest to you that if we are really thinking truly about each child's potential, then we'll stop saying that they all have to learn the same stuff at the same time. That we'll think about an equity hypothesis that says that when kids have the opportunity to fully engage in their learning and, and what they bring to the learning experience, that they can thrive. So we also absolutely, particularly in these COVID times, we want people to be able to cope with the normal stresses of life. And I don't know about you, but here in Canada, we're seeing more and more kids saying, this is too hard, I give up. And we're seeing many more kids with anxiety. And it's almost as if they've learned about anxiety and it now becomes a thing but people are not spending enough time to say, well, you know, we all have anxiety, it's pretty normal. What you can do about it is look to see when have you been anxious before you got through it and other, and other strategies. But coping with the normal stresses of life is becoming a bigger concern for us as, as uh, mental health, as well as educators. So we also, well-being is about working productively and fruitfully and able to make a contribution to his or her community. So well-being is not just about we, it's about us. It's not just about me, it's also about we. So I'm also very impressed with the First Nations way of thinking and way of knowing the world. And we in Canada have looked at a very, very uh, important document, the First Nations Mental Wellness Continuum Framework. And I'm gonna suggest that we think about how well-being is about creating the balance between the spiritual, emotional, physical uh, world and cognitive world. And so when we think about well-being, I want to, to be thinking about this as in, a, essential for the education of civic society. So mental well-being is about having a sense of purpose. We know from great research evidence from Heather Mallon and, uh, and her research that, that kids don't have a sense of purpose in education. So often they're just going through the motions. Well, that is something we really need to be thinking about. A sense of hope. Many kids don't have a sense of what's in my future, what's good for me. I'm just going through the motions. They're not engaged fully in why they're learning what they're learning. A sense of belonging, I'll talk more about this later, is so crucial. From the neuroscience perspective, we know that if we can help kids have a sense of belonging, then their neuro, the brain chemicals that create interference with learning from stress get neutralized. And then we need to think about meaning in our daily life. So a, a feeling of well-being comes when we have all of these together. Think of that greatest moment.
And when we've got meaning in our daily lives, it means that our needs, what's important to us, our values, our goals, and our strengths are all in alignment. I say that's not a bad thing to be thinking about in terms of education. And I want to, I want to make it clear right from the start, a little teaser. I don't think that we need to be thinking about, oh my gosh, we have to do all of this in addition to uh, covering academic and developing, helping kids develop competencies. I really believe, and this is what the team is also thinking about, that these two can be so completely integrated and integral to each other, that when we think about the six, um, uh, the six competencies, the six Cs, that they make so much sense. But so here we've got first hypothesis, when we are well, we learn better. The second hypothesis here is that stress, which is absolutely normal in life, if it's excessive, can interfere with our thinking and our learning. But as we sit in this time of COVID-19, what Bruce Perry, who is one of my absolute heroes in terms of understanding the brain, what he says to us is that the most powerful buffer in times of stress and distress is our social connectedness. So let's all remember to stay physically distant but emotionally close in these times of COVID-19. And if you go to that, you're, you'll have the slides. And if you look at that, um, that website there, there's much, much wisdom there. So let's just show the brain geek part here. Why is the brain so important to learning and how does stress interfere with it? So in this picture, you see an upside down, if you like, the blue part is the top of the brain, the green and yellow part are deep inside the limbic system, and the pink part is the, uh, the brain stem, the, the area responsible for blood pressure, heart rate, and temperature. What we know is that the brain develops in a hierarchical fashion. That is the primitive stuff at the bottom there, the pink and the yellow bits. They develop connections, neurons firing up together ahead of the connections that happen with the limbic system, that's the emotional system, uh, and the last areas to finally get wired up is the cortex. And that happens all the way through until 28, 20, 30 years of age. So the brain is under construction. What we now know is that experience has a huge role in building those connections throughout the brain. What we also know is that if the lower parts of the brain get activated, the limbic system, that's the fight or flight system, the emotional reactivity system, if that area gets ignited ahead of the planning, organizing, then learning doesn't happen. If our stress system is overwhelmed, is firing, 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 new learning cannot in fact happen. So here's another graphic of this. Important to keep in mind, some stress, very good. Too much stress, don't expect learning to be happening. And you can think about that in your own, um, in your own life. You know, um, earlier today, I had some challenges, shall we say, with my computer and my printer. And so I couldn't think of the very basic function of how do you turn on your, um, uh, your PowerPoint presentation. So, ah, uh, yes, we have to do the om um in order to, well, I'll tell you about some of the strategies we have to do. So here's this graphic here, very simple to know why are we so stressed in these times of COVID? Well, it has to do with uncertainty. So that upside down triangle or that triangle in that way, when we are uncertain, when it's not clear what to, what's predictably known, then that creates some tension in our brain. And in fact, the brain I'll talk about in the next section, the brain really likes predictability. It, it's seeking and scanning the environment for threat and reward in the environment. So when it is as uncertain as it is, give yourself a break. It makes sense that you're anxious and you're stressed. But what about an education? What we know is if kids are overly stressed, they are not going to learn. Why is that? So this is this another, uh, another way that we engage the brain. And the first thing we have to do 
is learn how to regulate all of the stimulation that's coming in. What do we focus on? What do we pay attention to? And once we start helping kids regulate, which we do first of all by co-regulating, then you're able to relate to them, to make connections, you're able to hook on to previous knowledge, and then they can connect to reason. So regulate first, relate, and then to reason. So take that brain biology, and then we have the work of Mary Helen Imordino Yang around emotion. So why is well-being, emotion, and stress all interrelated? Because it's literally but neurobiologically impossible to build memories, engage complex thoughts, or make meaningful decisions without emotion. For too long, we have ignored the fact that emotion has a huge part to do in our learning or paying attention or being able to focus or being able to get down from regulate up to relate and up to reason. And so what she says is that when educators fail to appreciate the importance of students' emotions, they are, I have to move my, uh, my, I can't read the whole slide here. One moment, please. When educators fail to appreciate the importance of students' emotions, they fail to appreciate a critical force in students' learning. One could argue, in fact, they fail to appreciate the reason that students learn at all. So, you know, old Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. And what we're realizing with the science of learning and development and mind-brain science is that I feel, therefore I learn. So as we go to the next slide, I want to start a provocation for what we're going to think about next. So if emotion plays such a role in the classroom, we have to be thinking not just about the emotion of the kids, but also the emotion of the teacher and recognize that the teacher, this was said by Haim Gino from Yale many, many years ago, that the teacher creates the weather in the classroom. What does that mean? It means that it is absolutely essential that we create that sense of belonging and that we connect before we correct. But you know, I did a presentation in Toronto uh, not too long ago and one person came up to me afterwards and she said, Jean, you need to say that the principal creates the weather for the teachers. So on that little note, let's open the, uh, let's open the floor for, for some questions. Thanks, Jean. We've got three questions. Okay. And um, the first one is this. So you were discussing um, excessive stress yes. uh, and how it shuts down the learning. But how, how do educators know what is too much stress and what is not enough stress? Because you also said that we do need a little bit of stress. Can you answer that? That's a terrific question. And what we know is that it is absolutely individually um, experienced differently. Um, so we know and we can observe and we need to become, I say, we need to become better readers of the body of uh, the physical body and the, the, the ruddiness of the face, we need to be better at picking up the cues that kids are being stressed. So one of the things that we know is there are groups of children whose biology, their experience builds the brain. And there are groups of children that we know who have experienced trauma, maltreatment, and neglect, and uh, very trying uh, in, in, uh, environments, that they are much more likely to experience stressors that are overwhelming and overpowering. What we don't know is what is too much stress for an individual child. So it means that we need to be thinking, building relationship building connection and really asking and sitting with the child. And when they say, this is too much, I can't do it. Sitting with them and saying, you know, I believe in you. I believe that you can do this. What can we do? What is it you need in order to accomplish this? What I hear from educators is that they have a belief that kids can do more, but the parents are saying, oh, they're too anxious. They can't do more. And so it talks to the very big need for educators and students and parents to be working collectively together. And then seeing with each child, 
what is their stress level and how can you build that relationship that says, I care about you and I'm going to push you. I'm going to keep these high expectations going. It is a delicate educator brilliance that, uh, that we need to be helping people develop for sure. Speaks to really knowing your students, doesn't it, Jean, it's and really right. getting to know them. Thank you. We, um, and we invite you to um, uh, pose your questions. We have a number of them here. One comes from a military mom, and she um, is indicating that um, the stress of moving, and we know that the students who are very mobile, going from home to home to home, can create a lot of stress for kids. Do you have any um, advice for some of those families that are highly mobile? Yes, absolutely. So the, the next part of the talk that I'm going to talk about is how can we manage our stress and the stress of others? We'll, we'll touch on that a little. Because what we want to do with stress is look at our pattern. How can we, even with conditions of moving a lot, create the home as a safe harbor wherever you are so that there are predictability, there's routines that are happening no matter where in the world you are, that you have expectations, you have family meals, there are things that you do, you've got times when you connect with these for in the military, the parent who is away, you keep that those routines, uh, not rigidly, but you cre create as much predictability in the environment as you can. And the major mobilizer of having that be okay for kids is relationship and connection, is being fully present so that the kids feel felt by you. There are big challenges with peers, um, particularly kids who are more introverted than extroverted, uh, more challenges with peers, but giving kids the message that you can do this, you've done it before. And what helped you last time we moved to make more friends? I think it's really important that the relationship and the listening uh, that you do with your kids makes a huge difference. One more for now, and the, a number of questions are coming in, so we'll have some opportunity at the end as well to pose more questions. I lost you there, Maggie. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just reading them all coming in. Oh, okay. okay. Um, what are some of the strategies that can help students um, around self-regulation that you mentioned earlier? Yes, okay, so self-regulation, I rely very much on my colleague and Canadian colleague, Dr. Stuart Shanker, for thinking about um, self-regulation as a process. One of the things that people very often confuse self-regulation with is self-control. Right? So there's a big difference between controlling your impulses, not reaching out when you want it. That's self-control. Self-regulation is about recognizing the emotions and the feelings and the, uh, the, the biology, biological drives that you're experiencing and recognizing what to do with them. So as educators, what's very important is that when we see kids discombobulating, we can ask ourselves, is this stress behavior or is it misbehavior? And very often when you change your mindset to think about, well, maybe it is stress behavior. So how can I help? Is it biological? Is there a stressor, an energy sucker outer, you know, an energy uh, depleter um, uh, biologically that the child is sleepy, talk to the parents that the child is hungry, have programs at school? Um, is it the, a cognitive one? Is the material that I'm bringing to them too overwhelming for them? Do I need to break it into smaller chunks? Is it um, is a social stressor? Is it a pro-social stressor? So I would strongly recommend looking at the work of Stuart Shanker. Why? Because when you see that the, the behavior through the lens of all kids will do well if they can, and that much of the misbehavior is truly stress behavior, then you start being that detective. And then you can say to the child, I notice that when the room is really loud, that you get upset. How about we come over here and we get here um, headphones for you 
So you're helping the kids recognize those stressors. So Stuart Shanker's work in self-reg is absolutely wonderful in education, as well as uh, for most of us in life. Oh, that's helpful. Excellent, thanks. And we'll include uh, some of student um, Stuart Shanker's resources in a, a list for people in case they're unfamiliar, because I agree, he's, he's really uh, informative. We're going to pause for from questions, uh, but please keep these questions coming. They're excellent. And uh, we'll have a chance at the end um, to uh, pursue more of them. Back to you, Jean. Very good. Very good. All right. Thank you very much. So I will get my slide to move forward somehow. Yes, there we are. Um, so the next part of the um, uh, of our time together is going to focus on what can we do. What can we do during this time for our own well-being? How can we cultivate well-being in these uncertain times? As well as what can we do to help students and their families with their well-being? Um, I am a um, a, a relational. Um, uh, think about relations, think about connections. Uh, I am a, a one, one uh, track pony in some ways. So just to give you a heads up uh, that much of what I will be saying comes back to the huge importance of connecting before you correct. So what do we know about our own well-being during this time? And I've been listening to lots and lots of uh, experts and mindfulness and other things. And one of the key messages is in order to help those around us, we need to find our own calm. We need to put on, as this uh, slide says, we need to put on our own mask first. So Bruce Perry, is a psychiatrist and a, neuro, um, a, a neuroscientist who studies not only trauma, but how the brain biology affects our, our, our very physical uh, well-being. And what I want you to think about here is if we can create in our environment now in COVID-19, if we can make the stressors that we are experiencing more predictable, more moderate, and more controllable, then our physiology changes. And so our basic heart rate, our, our, the release of adrenaline and cortisol from our stress system is lowered. And when that stress system is lowered, then we're able to access our thinking brain, our cognitive think, our, uh, part of the brain, and able to come up with some strategies. So as we're managing our stress, we want to be shifting things into as predictable as possible. So what does that mean? So somebody like Steve Jobs wore the same thing every single day so that that, uh, that particular decision was not something he had to worry about. What do we do? We create daily structure. And I have another slide here that you can take a picture of that also helps from a great article. So daily structure, family meals, limited media. So one of the key points that is made is that if you've got the TV on in the background with the news running over and over and over again, we recognize that it's on its repeat cycle, but kids don't know that. When they hear the same news over again, they think, oh my gosh, it's, gotten, it's become even worse than it was. Exercise. Why is exercise so important in these times? Because what we know from, uh, from great research, uh, one, one of the researchers wrote the book Spark, and what that talks about is when we exercise, we are actually cleaning out some of the gut that's in, in the, 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 that's very, very technical, um, in the brain and releasing more brain derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF for the brain that increases our learning and also our dopamine, our reward system. And when our dopamine system is firing, then we are open to new learning and we have pleasure reach out to others for help and connection. I'll talk at the end about gratitude and why helping others is so important. Get good sleep as much as you possibly can. As well, think for the future, be positive, future focused rather than negative. So why do we say this? Because what we know 
is that in situations where the, there is not predictability, where there's chaos, when the stressor for you and for kids is severe, prolonged, and it feels uncontrollable, it leads to things that are more challenging for the brain. And it leads to behaviors that are more uh, absolutely uh, uh, not as comforting and not as productive. So as we think about this, there are other, uh, other scientists who are thinking about what are some of the core functions then that we're talking about. And my dear friend, uh, Stephen de Groot, talks about three great states. So this is something for you to be thinking about for yourself as well as for others. And this is something that leaders can control in their relationships and in, in the environment. So how can you create safety? So you remember that triangle. That triangle uh, is, uh, is telling us that the more primitive parts of the brain are seeking out, is this a safe place? So create safety, create predictability, that sense of safety, I am emotionally, psychologically, and physically safe here is so important. Create a sense of significance. Do I feel like I belong? So as you, as some of your school leaders, as you're reaching out, it's important to let your teachers know that you appreciate the hard work that they're doing and how they're going beyond their own comfort zone and that you as a team are going to be working together. That creating a sense of belonging, that significance, you're valued and you're valuable is hugely important for the brain to be able to function maximally and to maintain health. And the last S is to be situated. That is to know, like the very first of several slides, that you have a sense of purpose, that you have a sense of direction, that you have a goal that goes beyond just your own well-being, but also to the connectivity uh, with others. So here are two great resources for you to, to go directly to. The first one is from the National Health Service and it's called, it's there you see it, learn dot, the number four uh, mental health dot, I can't, I have to just move the little box here, dot com. Uh, and as well as a wonderful, um, a wonderful article that was written by somebody who is in the network along with, um, along with um, uh, Bruce Perry, and it's in Psychology Today, and it's called The Pandemic Toolkit Parents Need. So what does it need for us to become regulated? So to regulate first, so that you can relate to others, so that you can reason and manage the workload that you have. So routine, sleep, exercise, lend your calm, find your quiet place. You know, I have so many of the adults I've worked with over the years who have no idea where their happy place is. They have no idea where they get calmed and soothed. Have family meals together. Have uh, uh, recognize that reaching out to other makes a big difference. Limit screen time and also keep an eye on the future, where we're going, what makes a difference, um, when will this be over? So a key concept in all of this, in helping others and in helping each other and your own self is creating that sense of belonging, that feeling felt. What can I tell you? I can tell you personally from my own, I have five children and five, uh, five grandchildren. And I, even though we're not able to connect physically at this time, we are connecting very, very deeply on, uh, I read to the, the kids on Facebook. Um, I, we've got our, our weekly um, chats that we do. So I am striving as much as possible for my kids in this period of time to feel felt by me. That means that they are really seen by me in this time of COVID-19, even though we can't be physically together. So let me just in these last few minutes tie in what is so essential um, to think about, so well-being and what the, the, the work of New Pedagogies for Deep Learning is about. 
I'm going to say that why the six C's, which I'll talk about in a second, are so incredibly activating of learning is because it creates huge relationships with kids and, and through those relationships with teachers, with their peers, with the, the, the classroom, with the world, a true sense of belonging and identity. So I had the great pleasure of working with MAG to look at the six C's and new pedagogies for deep learning and to see, well, where is it that there is a parallel with well-being when it comes to character, citizenship, collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking. And what I realized is as a child psychiatrist, what struck me is that if we are truly able as educators to help young people, and might I add educators as well, to develop these competencies that as they are learning about citizenship, for example, a global perspective, as they're thinking about collaboration and learning about collaboration and communication and creativity, that they are in fact being immunized. They are being given the life skills, the competencies through the relationship, but also through their own personal development and identity formation and their sense of purpose as they get to change the world, they are immunizing themselves against further mental health challenges. That if we can, in fact, build a world where kids are really encountering these six Cs, they are going to be able to be more resilient, able to be able to take in the challenges of the day and say, I can manage this, or they're going to be able to navigate their way to resources so that they can then say, make it more predictable, make the stressors moderate and make it so that they are more resilient. So I told you I was a bit of a nut when it comes to relationship. I can tell you that there's great science that shows that when a young person is in the, um, in the uh, domain or the sphere of influence of a teacher who they feel uh, has a view of them that matters, they do well in life. The evidence is accumulating that they also do well academically. And so relationship, relationship, relationship. So here's a couple of last things before we open up for questions. What can we do right now, today, your practice that's gonna help you? Well, one is the gratitude. So, you know, I, I think of myself as a scientist and, and, you know, think when somebody said, oh, well, here's a gratitude journal for you. I thought, well, what the heck? What's, what is saying, uh, thank you for this. I'm grateful for this. What is that going to do? So then I have, a, I have a lifelong learning brain. And so I looked into it, the neuroscience of gratitude. And what we've discovered, as I read, is that gratitude actually biologically alters your brain. So that the activity of being thankful for what you've got is changes, it makes the, the, the evidence is accumulating to say it makes you happier. It makes you healthier. People who are grateful have more uh, fancy white cell and uh, cytokines and other things. Um, and it makes you a better uh, humane person reaching out, reaching out to others. So it changes the neurotransmitters for those of you who are interested, the dopamine and, um, and uh, serotonin uh, receptors, as well as oxytocin as you're reaching out to others. So why do I bring in gratitude at this time? Because it's really easy to, to, um, uh, to experience, I'm overwhelmed. You know, there's this thing called decision fatigue. You're bombarded, bombarded with decisions you've had to make very, very quickly with all, all of the information that you need. And at the end of the day, you're exhausted. But what we know from this science is if you say that was a tough day, but I'm thankful that I accomplished this, it changes your mindset and it changes what you're able to do the following day. 
And then I just couldn't resist um, uh, putting in something. Find as much as you can that makes you laugh. My cousins in Scotland are sending me these absolutely ridiculous, sometimes not printable um, uh, videos. So why? Well, laughter ignites so many different parts of your brain and it gives your brain, a, a, if you like, this is a neural myth, but it's, you know, it's along the lines of it makes a difference because it ignites areas of your brain that are helpful for health. So one thing to remember is what we now know that the kids are going to remember. And I love this quote from Maya Angelou. During this time of COVID-19, if we wonder what are the kids going to remember about it this time? It's not going to be the multiplication tables or the French word for happiness, guys. It's going to be, as Maya Angelou says, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel. So I hope uh, in my own uh, unique um, uh, uh, Scottish humor way, have been able to get some things for you to think about. That relationships, how big a role have relationships played in your educational journey so far? Have we brought in, are we thinking well enough? And when you stop and think about it, you know yourself that when you have been ignited by learning, that you've learned better, longer, and you've, for many of you, it's why you became a teacher in the first place. So I'm on it. we know, we know that relationships matter. So remember our first task at the beginning? It was three things that were new, two things so interesting that you are going to share them with someone else, and one thing you'll change about your practice based on the information shared today. So maybe that's something you can take a minute to think about now. What is one change in practice that you will focus on as a result of today? So thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm hoping that you've got something at least that you can take and um, nourish and rub into a lovely little oyster. Thanks very much. Over to you, Mag. Thank you, Jean. And speaking of rubbing into a lovely little oyster, let's, let's seize this moment, shall we? And if people can just jot down, perhaps even in the chat box or in their journals or on their hand, the one change in practice that has inspired you today um, or what's on your mind that you might want to explore further. Um, know that this recording is going to come to you and be available on our website, but let's just take a quiet minute now. So Jean, how would you suggest people um, balance their competing roles of teacher, playmate with their child, um, uh, parent, all these competing roles right now that I think create a lot of stress and strain for people. Yeah, well, I, uh, I hear you. I hear you. And um, um, uh, uh, what I say is don't try to be freaking perfect. That's uh, that, that we are just under so much pressure. My mantra as a parent has always been progress, not perfection that we really need to be thinking about through this period of time, as I said, what are our kids going to remember? So first of all, balance is out the window. We have never had as much demand for one, you know, one, uh, one family unit as, uh, as we have now. I, my own personal opinion is that it's important that employers are given the, the understanding that how kids and families make it through this period of time is going to be a very big predictor of how fast our economy is going to get back online. So mm -hmm. if you can still have expectations from employers, but back off somewhat, give some allowance, make our first priority the well-being of our families. So you know what? To me, that also goes for schoolwork. There is a lot of learning that happens that isn't related to what I call stuffing the duck, you know, getting the curriculum in there, covering all of these things. Kids learn massively through play. 
And if this is an opportunity, a time when you can start letting kids play and learn on their own at home with parents being supporters of learning at home, then maybe we're going to start a revolution in education that says, wow, you know, when kids are interested in things, man, oh man, they really learn. So as we see the huge variability, even just in our province, from um, directors of education saying this is about keeping people healthy, relationship and connection, to others saying you have to cover all of these overall expectations, we know that nobody has the answer. So stop and think about what makes sense for you as a family. What makes sense in terms of your stress load that you can make it predictable, you can make it moderate, and you can make it less complicated. Hmm. Some of um, these uh, questions relate to the stress and disappointment that uh, many of the youth are feeling. They haven't been able to attend their graduations or proms or join a sports team. Yeah. The normal activities that bring them joy um, just haven't been available to them at this time. What might you tell parents or ad advise them around how they can coach their, their kids back to a happier place? Yeah, well, the very, very first thing I say is listen to your kids. And rather than feeling that you have to go into your F2 mode, your find it, fix it mode, Ask them what they think would happen. Kids are starting Instagram uh, parties and proms, and they're, they're looking at ways that they can be around each other, far apart, but still see each other. If you want a problem solved creatively, ask a group of adolescents. So I think, first of all, we need to, we need to, we need to believe in the competence and capabilities of our kids. So that's number one. So no, that's number two. Listen first, competence and capabilities um, of, our, of our kids is second. The other thing is what we as adults have that kids don't have a sense of in terms of time is that we know that pain lessens with time. Right, we know that we know that you can manage things in the acute phase. It feels so dreadful, but with passage of time comes healing and comes uh, comes soothing. Kids don't get that right away. So rather than battling with them, saying, "Well, it's going to get better," you just sit with them and validate and says, "This really sucks. This really sucks." What can you do? What has helped you before to get through tough times? Because I'm here with you. I'm going to sit with you. And this is going to, we are going to get through this. We have to keep in mind that this is a couple of months in the, you know, 13 year history of education. But we have to be present with them so they feel felt by us and we listen. Hmm. Um, along that line, um, there are many questions here that I'm trying to collapse into one um, related to toddlers and pre-kindergarten children. And how do we um, support those children specifically during this time? Well, for me, the, the way that we support toddlers and uh, preschoolers is by creating the conditions where they can play. They learn not just best, but almost exclusively through play. So creating a, um, a routine is absolutely important but not not rigidity you know i saw i saw recently somebody had blocks of the day that were you know like military going through one to the other so create routine let the children play let them explore with you they learn tons as they're you know my my little uh, uh, uh my little grandchildren who are two and a half they were just i was talking to my daughter today they are playing all of the time they're missing child care for sure but they are playing all of the time she got them colored sticks and she didn't have to go zooming in there and say, okay, well, let's sort them into colors or let's do this or that. Their natural curiosity is one that has put them, they are putting them all into colors. And even, oh, my children are just, my grandchildren are just so brilliant. Uh, little Tommy even made a tea for, um, um, uh, for, for Tommy. So let the children play. Remember, it's love 
that builds brains. It's love that builds brains. So creating that environment where they have a sense of belonging, feel felt, play, and read to them tons and tons and tons. Oh my gosh. That sounds so good for all of us. <laughs> yeah, it does. It? it does. Thanks, Jean. I think we have time for just an, a, a couple more questions, maybe. Um, this one is intriguing. Um, how do the adults of the school make connections with children who don't have access to the internet or who are not inclined digitally? How do they keep them connected? Any yeah, ideas there? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge, isn't that just such a huge equity? It's a big one. It's a really, a really big one. And so what we know is that many kids have uh, the well, and I can't really, I can't think of the statistics offhand in terms of America and Canada. Uh, the kids who have uh, internet uh, compared to those who just have um, uh, have phone. What what is important is to find the ways not to have big long conversations with kids, but the dose effect is just small little tweets if you can. Little tweets, I'm thinking about you, wondering how you're doing, how are things. I saw uh, recently on Twitter uh, a group of teachers from a school who the, she, they knew the kids didn't have, um, didn't have access to these things, drove by their houses waving, saying, hi there, we're thinking about you, how you doing? Well, keep, uh, keep going, we're going to get through this. So what's important is that human, is that human connection and, and that it can happen. It doesn't need to be a big significant, oh, tell me all your woes. I just, a touch base, I'm thinking about you, you matter to me, uh, I care, is, uh, is hugely powerful. Thanks, Jean. And I think we have time for just one more question. And I think uh, many of us, um, our brains are starting to go here now. So we're hoping at some point uh, that schools will reopen. And the question here is, how do we prepare our children for the return back to childcare and school? Life will be different upon return. Do you have any thoughts around what you would tell, um, advise parents to tell their children? Yeah, so, um, so there's two thoughts that come to mind. One is leadership through this time is absolutely huge how our system, how our leaders think about the power of connection and relationship, how are, are they think about what developmentally is appropriate for kids at what stage in time. So for example, for little ones, it would make no sense to just rush and bring them all back in together, that there should be a staggered entry and for and for the teachers and the and, and child care for them to be an intentional reconnecting and building relationship for kids who are older than that i have heard and agree that as the kids are coming back that the first month of school is not about anything academic but it's all about building that sense of belonging and um and tell me what you did what you loved what you learned and learn from the students about what the experience has been so teachers so parents can tell their kids that the there are many many people who have been thinking long and hard about how we can make ourselves safe. That's why we've stayed home. That's why we've kept our physical distance, but emotional connection, just so. Just so it is, yeah, it's really but about connection. It's yeah. really about connection and, and recognizing people are thinking about it. Thanks, Jean. Well, I think that's all the time we have, but I have a feeling that um, people could have certainly spent another hour on these questions and answers. Let's just turn to the next slide, please. Just want to thank Jean uh, for her session today. It's been so helpful and, and clarifying for so many of us and uh, given us so many good ideas about how to support kids, but also how to support ourselves during this time. And I think you say it best, Jean, that the connection is key. Um, this recording will be available. Um, on our NPDL website. Um, there you'll find more videos, uh, including Jean, Jean Clinton, the article that she mentioned, and other really powerful resources that you can use 
with your colleagues and communities at this time and they're all available to you for free so please access that and support each other um, if you're interested in um, the global deep learning social movement certainly contact us at that information there and and before we close if you can just um, flip the slide one more time, Jean. So pleased to let you know that we are holding another webinar um, and we invite the whole global community to um, interact with Joanne Quinn. Joanne is um, going to be exploring the new role of teachers in activating engagement and cultivating well being during these times. Joanne is an author of many books, including Coherence The Right Drivers in Action for Schools, Districts, and Systems and as well the deep learning engage the world change the world and the most recent book dive into deep learning tools for engagement along with michael fullen joanne is also the global director of npdl we really hope you'll join us for that session i'm i'm sure it'll be just as thought-provoking as today's was on that we leave you and say be well take care and um and thank you for joining us we hope to see you again soon goodbye everybody <laughs>